Today, we talk about artistic wedding images on Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, your host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all those stories and challenges that happen in between. As always, the show notes for this show will be at BehindTheShot.tv, along with a little bit that I wrote about my guest today and a small gallery of his work. I also want to remind you that you can subscribe to this podcast, and please do, because it really does help in a number of ways when we have subscribers in three different ways. If you're a YouTube viewer, the video is on YouTube. If you are the type of person that prefers to use a podcast app, there are two versions of this show, an audio only, and yes, there is a video feed of this show that you can get in your podcast app, assuming that your app supports video like pod, uh, Apple Podcast does. That's probably the best thing. Something I want to remind you of before we bring today's guest on is the uh, critique shows that I'm doing with Don Komarechka. If you are a Flickr member, you can participate in this. And if you're not a Flickr member, dude, what's up? All you got to do is go over to Flickr. You can do the free account or you can do the pro Flickr account. Join Flickr. They need the help. Once you're a Flickr member, join the Behind the Shot group and submit any images that you want critiqued by Don Komarechka and myself with the hashtag, actually not hashtag, I should say Flickr tag, BTS critique. That's actually a key distinction. Let me say that once again. It's not a hashtag. Flickr has their own tagging systems. BTS critique, all one word, Put the picture in the Behind the Shot group on Flickr. That makes it eligible. We're doing those usually early in the month, and we're doing one a month right now. But Don Komarechka of Photo Geek Weekly is one of the most knowledgeable human beings that I know. And it's always fun to hear what he says about photos. So that brings us to today's guest. Now, before I bring him in, let me just give a little background. I've known about this gentleman for years and years and years. And there are actually times that I have walked a showroom floor at like a WPPI or something like that and seen him speaking and wanted to go watch and couldn't get anywhere near Roberto Valenzuela when he was on stage. Roberto, how are you? Amazing. How are you, Steve? This is fun. I'm doing really, really well. I thank you so much for coming on the show. It is much, much appreciated. And I mean what I said when I've gone through and you've been speaking at a booth somewhere and the crowds are just insane. So let's explain <laughs> you to people that don't know you, that don't shoot your genre, don't go to shows. You're a Canon Explorer of Light, which in and of itself is a heck of an achievement because there's, you know, 40, 50 Canon Explorers of Light. You're primarily known as a wedding photographer, but you shoot other things. Mm -hmm. I have, um, I expanded my, my, what I photograph and my business. So I used to shoot mainly weddings. And I got to say, I still love wedding photography the most. I, I think that's the most challenging and I enjoy it. But um, because I live in LA and because I have a studio, I started shooting commercial fashion a lot. This is what I do. Uh, a lot of commercial fashion, a lot of uh, like uh, conceptual portraits type of thing. Uh, and then, of course, I shoot a few weddings a year still. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. and you do a lot of things other than that. Along with, you know, this cross genre type photographer, you're a speaker, as I mentioned, an educator, which kind of goes hand in hand. You're an author. You've got some books that we'll talk about as well. And you're a musician. And I want to touch on that one first, because <laughs> I find it interesting how many photographers that I know that are a musicians, but in particular, guitarists. Rick Salmon is a guitarist, fellow ex explorer of light like you. Uh, David Bergman is a musician. Frank Dorhoff is a guitar player. It's it's mm -hmm. interesting to me, but you are actually a concert classical guitarist. Right. Totally not as cool as, as like electric guitarists, you know? So I was definitely I like, that. you know, it's like the, the nerdiest, the nerdiest branch of photography. That was, that was definitely my kind, but I did professional concert classical guitar for a decade. I, I also, I was a concert guitarist, so people would pay for a ticket. They would watch me, they would watch me play an entire concert by myself. So totally solo. There would be an intermission. There would be a second set, first set, that would, the whole thing. Uh, I would play, um, I didn't play classical that much. I played um, Argentinian tangos, Brazilian sambas, Spanish, uh, 
Spanish music for classical guitar, and I would always add some kind of flamenco flair to it all to get people all pumped up about it when they were in the audience. They they, they loved the crazy speed and rasqueados that I used to do, and people just used, used to go bananas over it. And sometimes I would alter the music to add some of that flashy stuff, and people just went crazy for it. It was a lot of fun. Do you, do you still play at all? Um, I don't play. Uh, I have my guitar out. Uh, uh, no. Um, I try to pick it up again. I'm so busy that it takes hours and hours of practice. However, my, my sister-in-law just got married and she asked me to play uh, Canon in D by Johann Paco Bell. And I played Canon in D for her at her wedding and it was beautiful to take my guitar out, dust it, dust it off. And I got the strings, you know, I got a new set of strings. I got the guitar tuned up and then I played, I memorized, I memorized like the most difficult interpretation of that song for classical guitar i don't know why i did something so dumb but i went for the most difficult type of uh, arrangement that i could find because it was so beautiful and i said to myself if i'm gonna play canon in d i don't just want to play the simple arrangements i want to do the most beautiful arrangement that i can find and it felt amazing steve to take the guitar out and perform it at the wedding and i performed it beautifully at the wedding it was the only time where i did not make a single mistake playing at a temple. Well, and of course, you know, as artists, that type of stuff matters to us. I mentioned the workshops and, and well, the speaking and education is as it were, but you do workshops and speaking and and education and seminars and conferences and all that, which kind of brings me to something I want to talk about of yours, which is the photo creators conference and experience. Because for example, when I went to the website, which so that, you know, if you want to go check out the website on this, and I highly recommend you do, it's the photocreators.com. But when I was browsing through the website, first, I saw that it was in Tucson, Arizona, which is where you graduated from University of Arizona. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also the instructor list that is set up for this conference, Joel Grimes, another Canon Explorer of Light, two Nikon ambassadors, Jen Rosenbaum and Rocco and Cora, mm-hmm. explain to people uh, photo creators, the photo creators.com and the photo creators conference and, and experience. I understand it's been postponed and there will be dates. People can go to the website to get all the information that they need. Right. Yeah. Uh, the photo creators conference came from set five years of teaching a lighting conference in Tucson based on my book called picture perfect lighting. Uh, I had, I wrote this book and I wanted to create a, a workshop for it. And I did it in Tucson because it's, it's in a ranch. Uh, the, why the ranch? Why fly people to Tucson? Because the ranch is out in the middle of nowhere, Steve. It's You basically unplug from the world. You still have internet access. You can still use your phone. But it does feel like a retreat where you totally concentrate in knowledge of lighting. And why did I go through all this trouble? Well, I feel that posing is the most difficult thing to master in photography, uh, on all people photography. And I think lighting is the one element of photography where people get super lazy. Like people don't really, they don't really push themselves because it's scary. It's scary to push yourself in lighting when you're in front of a client. The result is a lot of the, a lot of the portrait and wedding photographers in the, in the world have a very similar look. Does that make sense? Like their portraits have a similar look in their lighting and their weddings have a similar look. And I, I, I feel like, because I travel the world teaching, one of the things that propelled me to be successful as a photographer is my lighting and my posting separate me from the rest of the of, of the field, and they separate me a lot. Like it's a it's a large separation, and clients no, notice it, it. Yeah, you know, yeah, clients notice it. They're like, your lighting is always it's almost poetic. It sounds beautiful. It looks beautiful. Your posting looks like you never post anything. It looks totally natural. That's the key. That's what I want. I want the posing to look invisible. In other words, people don't notice it because it's so flawless. It's just so natural. And I want the lighting to be used to communicate something, not just to illuminate your subjects. And with that being said, after five, six years of teaching the the Picture Perfect Lighting Workshop in Tucson, Arizona, I thought it was time to expand it and create the world's only pure lighting conference. So everyone that goes to that, it is my goal for them to kick serious lighting butt when they leave the workshop or the, when they leave the, the conference. I want, I want people to experience what it's like to manage 
understand and really manipulate lighting exactly how you want or exactly how you envisioned instead of just defaulting to the normal stuff we always do. So it was, uh, um, I, I invited Rocco and Cora because Rocco and Cora is, coming, is going to come in from Australia because once you have a, a, a photograph that's lit in a way that it communicates something, like the photo says something to the viewer, when you print that and you print it masterfully, it is an entire new level of photography that pe- I want people to experience and I want their clients to experience it. it it's masterful printing of a really well lit image has completely, my jaw dropped when I started seeing these kinds of images. My students' jaws drop when they see their photos printed and they are lit incredibly well. It makes your photos look like they're popping out of the paper. And I think with that, you will people will be able to separate themselves from, from, a, from the field. And I think now more than ever, we must push ourselves in that direction. I, I think, you know, you hit on so much there. And I, I think really lighting tends to be the one area that most, most you know, newer, I'm doing newer in air quotes for those listening to, to audio. Most newer <laughs> photographers are afraid of, you've got books on a number of these type of subjects. You mentioned, you know, one of your books, you, you've got five books. What's interesting is your latest book, which is called Wedding Storyteller Volume 2, and it's wedding case studies and a workflow for doing weddings. And the photo that we're going to talk about today Mm -hmm. is actually the cover of that book. Now, before we get into this photo and and some actual deep photography instruction, there's one thing I just got to say, and that is we're recording this show, what is it, uh, March 21st of 2020. And so we're kind of in the middle of all of this COVID-19 coronavirus type craziness that's happening in and around the world. And I just, while I know that's not why you come to a show like this, in fact, arguably it's the opposite. There's a million places for you to get information and news and be bombarded with all of this craziness that's happening. And I want to be the escape for that. I want you to escape that reality, be able to come in and just think about something else for a little bit. But that said, I do want to take a minute to say that I I hope everybody is doing well. I hope everybody is staying safe. And as Roberto and my mutual friend, Scott Heath, was talking to me the other day, and he made a comment to me that stuck in my head, and that is people also need validation that it's okay to be worried. So yes, it's okay to be worried for you to think about the real world. And at the same time, it's okay for you to take a little bit of a break and just give yourself a breather and have some fun and enjoy this show and learn some new things. Roberto, for you, as we're looking at this from a helicopter view, how can people feed their creative soul while they're in this situation? Well, as you may or may not know, but a lot of people that know me know, what some of my biggest training in photography when I just began happened with bananas, fruits, and vegetables like this. So... Uh, I would try to use my flashes to illuminate a banana or a cantaloupe or a pineapple or whatever. And I would try to experiment by creating ratios with the bananas and all this different stuff. If you are stuck at home because of COVID-19 right now, and you have some fruits or you have some vegetables (laughs) laying around, (laughs) um, it's actually kind of fun to put your flashes and, and try to create groups, try to create group A, group B, try to create ratios of the flashes going off. Like you don't have to hire people. You don't have to bring people into your home to do this. You can just do this with, with whatever you have laying around. I honestly trained with vegetables and fruits at the beginning of my and career. And the other cool thing is you don't have to worry about the photos coming out, right? You're not <laughs> looking for them to be, you know, iconic fruit and vegetable photos. You're looking <laughs> to learn. Look at when the fo- Look at when the light's wrong to you and just learn from it. Another thing that I think will be fun besides learning like how to, how to change like the lighting on, le- on, on A and B and all these things, create different ratios and stuff. But the most important thing, Steve, is get faster at it. Like if you are home doing nothing, turn off your flashes, turn off your camera, have your banana in front of you, and then have your flashes set up to the left and to the right of the banana. And then, and then get your iPhone and clock yourself ready, go, boom, you start the timer, you turn on the camera, you turn on the flash, you turn on the other flash, you set group A, you set group B, you make sure they're linked, and then you turn on, you go to manual, 
then you turn the power one, the power on one down, the power on the other one up, and then you fire, stop the clock. Um, and then try doing that with three flashes. You have A, B, and C. And then try doing that with, try softening the light with paper towels. You don't have to go to your studio and rent soft boxes and all this jazz. Just simply put a paper towel around the flash and see what that does to the, to, to, to the softness of the light, to the shadows. Turn off your stuff, try it again. I cannot tell people what a great opportunity right now in COVID-19 where we're, we're all home, forced to be home. What an amazing time to get speedy and efficient at turning on your stuff and, and just say, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. Um, in my Picture Perfect Lighting book, there is a chapter on speed exercises for your flashes. If you actually have that book, uh, you can go to that chapter. I don't know what chapter it is anymore, but there is a chapter called Speed Exercises for Flashes. If you open that chapter up and you go through those exercises, you will become a ninja of speed when it comes to any function those flashes have to offer. And I think that's this is the perfect time to do that. And, and I'm going to take what you just said, and I'm going to kind of segue that into what I shoot, which is live music. And there's so many people that shoot live music, but they really want to get more into doing band portraits backstage. Well, when you do band portraits backstage, you're going to get 15 seconds, right? They're going to walk the musician back. You're going to be in the back of a trailer or backstage somewhere. You're going to snap your portrait and they're gone. So speed exercises are really, really good. And it, what you just reminded me of as we're talking about this, like I say, take your break and learn from today's video because Roberto has just tons of information. In his bio, he has this quote, and I love this quote, so I pulled it out. I'm going to read it to you because it, it goes exactly to what he just said. And I'm quoting here. Roberto believes that it is not talent, but deliberate practice that is at the core of skill and achievement. So there's your practice session. Go grab yourself some fruit, or if you can find it, I suppose you could use toilet paper <laughs> nowadays, but nobody can find it. Um, so with that in mind, you're a Canon Explorer of Light. You obviously shoot Canon. Uh, are there any tools that you use other than your camera and lens that you think are critical to what you do, whether it be an app, whether it be a piece of hardware that you use, but other than the camera and lens, right? I'm assuming, do you shoot uh, a 1DX series, a 5D series, an EOS R? What do you shoot, by the way? All three. Um, if I'm dealing with a person that blinks a lot or I'm dealing with ner nervous photographers or something like this, I mean, people who just blink a lot, I use the 1DX Mark II. Uh, now they have the 1DX Mark III, but I don't have that. The 1DX Mark II allows me to shoot faster, allows me to, to uh, if people blink or not blink, I, I just capture that those eyes open more if i'm dealing with somebody who's a little bit nervous uh, about shooting or whatever i use my, my eos r that, that's like my go-to camera and then of course i use i still use the 5d mark 4 and the 5ds and the 5dsr so i kind of use all of them but my main camera right now is the eos r and any other yeah. hardware that you use that matters to you i mean in the studio um besides lighting like the, my pro photo stuff um I mean, I'm, I'm using, I'm using uh, this, it, it's called a, a, a studio, a studio stand, you know, which I don't really recommend anyone to go get that. It, it, it's a studio thing, but I mean, you're asking me about any kind of other hardware that I use. I, I do use a studio stand. It, it, it allows me to, it's a 300 pound piece of device that just, it's like a tripod on steroids. But once you okay. have one of those, it allows you to do things you couldn't do with a tripod. And it's kind of fun to play with those angles because it allows you to do angles you couldn't do with anything else. So that's kind of fun. I also have um, quite a bit of LED lights that I used to, I like to experiment with, Stella, Stella lights. And especially right now, because I'm doing portraiture using uh, slow shutter speed portraits, which is about, the portraits that I take are about 10 seconds uh, in, in the exposure. So the shutter speed is open for 10 seconds while I'm taking the portrait of, of people. And when you do that, you do kind of want to have an LED light to illuminate the subject as you are shooting. And it creates a skin softening effect on the, on the, on the portrait you're taking without ever opening the photo in Photoshop. But it still leaves the eyes and the hair tack sharp because the flashes flash at the end. So it's like a second curtain sink situation. Okay, so, yeah creates a skin softening effect on camera and that's something that i've been doing a lot lately in my studio so i, I do have some uh, stella okay. stella led lights mm -hmm. 
Okay. So with that in mind, then I want to get into today's image and I'm going to start by trying to describe this image. And as wedding images go, this is fairy tale land. I mean, it's just this wonderful, beautiful image. And if, if you're listening to the audio feed, please go to the website behind the shot.tv and down at the bottom of this episode show notes, you'll see a selection of shots from Roberto and this being one of them. It's a dirt road uh, surrounded by trees and the sun. And these are those type of trees. I don't know what they are. They're like willow trees or something, the kind that have those like things hanging from them. The sunlight is coming through that road or excuse me, coming through the, the canopy of those trees in thin light beams coming around the bride and groom. The bride and groom are walking down the road hand in hand, looking at each other with a smile. All of this detail beautifully evident at the same time as it's a wide shot. It's almost a 16-9 ratio. It's just slightly off, like four pixels off from 16-9. Um, there's a hazy feel, like a dusty feel, but it doesn't look like they're choking in dust. I mean, it's just this this beautiful that you can see the light beams. They're in motion, which I love. So they're they're looking at each other. They're walking. Uh, just super, super, super well done. I'm guessing this was your Canon. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was, do you know which uh, body and lens this was? That was probably the 5D Mark II. Okay. Um, yeah. actually, I think I looked up EXIF data on this and it was a 50 millimeter. Does that sound about right? Uh, I don't remember, Steve. I don't remember. Okay. I, I thought it was wider and, than that. Yeah. I think it showed a 50 millimeter 1.2, if I'm not mistaken. And I was surprised because okay. it was, it was low ISO. It, it was like 200 F 2.2. And I think it was a high shutter, like 800 or something like that. And one of the things that jumped out at me that I do remember for sure was it said manual white balance was on. Do you normally shoot manual white balance? For complicated photos like that, I do. It's it's a lot easier. I, I don't really I don't really think that the, the presets sometimes the presets give you a color cast that I don't really want. And and to me, I hate editing photos on anything. I just want to take the photo properly. So I'm if I have five extra seconds, I do dial in the white balance and it makes my life a lot easier, you know? And, so, yeah. and aperture priority is your mode? Manual? What are you shooting? I don't even know what aperture priority is. I just use manual pretty much 100% of the time. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know what it is. I'm just saying. I, I've never put, I rarely put my camera on anything other than manual. Um, it's just the way, it's just, I, I like to control those things and it's just easier. So, now, now the details on this shot, because there, there's some things on this shot I'm dying to know. First of all, by the way, where is this? Okay, that is in Savannah, Georgia, in a place called Wormslow. So if you type in Wormslow, Savannah, Georgia, you will see the exact location where that was taken. Uh, if you do go online and you try to find Wormslow wedding photos, uh, you will see that basically the same type of photo that every photographer usually takes, which is in the middle of the road, the couple is has their they're not in mo in motion they're static, and they have their they're either kissing holding hands or they're basically putting their foreheads together with their eyes closed. <laughs> you know this is like the, yeah, right the, typical yeah the typical like three or four go to poses that every photographer does. Um, one of the things that I like to tell to people is to add some hot sauce to your photographs. Always find a way to add some chili. Why chili? Because the chili awakens your senses, right? When you eat food and then you, you get that spice, it awakens your taste buds. It opens up your mouth to, to explore the other flavors of all the other foods. It's like salt, right? So to me, I always ask myself when I show up to a place like this, where is my hot sauce? Why, what, what can I do to this that will add that extra element of spice to the photograph? When people look at this photo, I want them to go, wow, no, that's beautiful or that's cool. I want them to be like, whoa, like something happened in their senses, right? That's the hot sauce. Which is exactly, by the way, what I did. And my first thought when I saw this shot actually was, how did you coach them? So did you just tell them, back up, walk towards me, back up, walk towards me, back up, walk towards me for each take? I mean, or did you say to them, you know, hold hands, look, where did you go? So in my posing book, uh, Picture Perfect Posing, I talk a lot about posing people walking the right way. So if you have couples walking towards you, they're going to walk with their feet straight, to, like 
to wherever they're pointing. Like if they're walking this way, their feet are going to be pointing this way. If you photograph that, it looks very robotic. If you video people walking, it looks better. But if you're taking a still capture of, some, of people walking, they are awkward 90% of the time in a still photograph. So first I had to worry about her arms. Her arms have to be doing something. So I had to make sure that she was holding up her dress in order, in order for her to have something for her arms to do. Second, I needed to make sure that they crossed See, that, hold, hold on a second, because that's sure. key. She mm-hmm. wasn't just holding it on her own while you were walking. That was a conscious thought of yours? 100%. It has to be something you tell them. They don't know to do that. <laughs> they, don't know. they don't know to do that, Steve. Uh, people, are not, people are not aware of how to do things in front of the camera. They want to look beautiful. They rely on the photographer to have ex- ex- posing expertise to make them look their best. This is why I spend so much time teaching and coaching in posing. Um, second, I needed them to cross their legs when they were walking. Why? Crossing the legs looks like they're about to turn. It looks like the, the action is higher. If they were not, if they are not crossing their legs, it looks like they're just walking perfectly straight. By doing a small cross, it looks like he's about to shift his body weight because he's got, he might approach her to kiss her. You don't know what's going to happen but, but by crossing the legs, there's a little bit of action there. <laughs> it creates this tiny little in- injection of what is he going to do now? What's happening? Are they going to come towards each other? Are they going to separate? Are they going to, is he going to try to kiss her in the cheek? Is he going to hug her of happiness? Without the leg cross, it's just people walking. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. See, but this, this is why I don't shoot weddings, but this is why I started this show. Cause it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're photographing a couple for whatever reason, this right. matters, this type of attention to detail. It's like, I was talking to a friend of mine, Renee Robin once about one of her photos and there was something weird with the fingers that just made it magic. And I'm like, did you coach that? She goes, I stood there and positioned every finger because detail matters. Is this the, the light beams that are in here are just gorgeous coming through the road. And is it all natural light? No, uh, I, 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 do, I did a test photo with this real quick with natural light and you couldn't even see the couple because the dust, oh. the dust basically covered them up. Okay. Where's um, the light? The light comes from my, my assistant holding a, a flash bare bulb hitting them. From where are they? My, Behind my the tree? assistant is about 25 feet in front or 20 feet in front of the groom. And we had to zoom the flash head to the highest that flash would go. So I think at that time, the flashes didn't, you couldn't zoom the flash head to 200. I think you could only go to like uh, one, whatever it was, 180 or something like that without zooming the flash head the flash would have not been able to reach the couple so you have i had to use every trick in the, the book. assistant is camera right here frame camera right? right camera right yeah he's and in, off my the screen though in, not yeah my assistant's about 20 feet right in front of the groom and the flash was wow. pointed at them and it wouldn't work with the flash head uh on the default zoom but as soon as we zoomed in the flash head we created more output into the flash so more power went through and it it was able to separate the couple from the rest of the dust all over the place because the couple was getting hit by the light from the flash too um now the couple only gave me one chance to do this because they didn't you know i i I don't know if you want to get into this now but you know that those those rays of light were created by a car that i i instructed to drive as, as fast as possible through the through the road and he was the driver okay. and the driver wasn't happy. Okay, now I see. And this is like people who go to Slot Canyon and you get all these pictures in a Slot Canyon of these ray beams and they don't realize that the guide grabs a handful of sand and throws it in the air. And it's just like in concerts, they have a hazer. The reason exactly. that there's fog at a concert is so that you can see the light beams. Exactly. You, without without the, the dust being picked up, you wouldn't see the light going through the canopy of trees. So the idea was... How do you create the hot sauce? Well, the hot sauce w- would be created by ac- accentuating the light beams coming from the canopy of light. Well, how do you do that? Well, I'm not going to go around picking up dirt and throwing it up in the sky. Not to mention, we don't have time. We were only at that location for five, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, so I asked the driver who was, w- who was driving like a Cadillac SUV or something, 
hey, man, can you do me a favor? I need you to drive away from us, turn around, and go as fast as you can, just floor floor it all the way through until you get past us. And then the driver thought I was completely insane. He was like, for what? And he didn't want to get the car dirty. I was like, your car will not get dirty because the dust will be behind you. So don't worry about the car. <laughs> and I said, look, I only have limited time. Can you just please do it? Uh, he wasn't happy, but he went ahead. The couple said, we can only do this one time. So I had to do a quick test. This is why you need to practice this stuff, Steve. This is why you need to practice with these bananas and stuff. Had I not had that down in my mind, I would have never been able to put together and push the buttons properly, zoomed in the flash head. I would have never been able to come up with this photograph. Practicing this stuff in, in times like this is key. So because of that, the guy drove, he turned around and he floored it all the way back towards us. He drove as fast as he can, picked up all the dust he could. As soon as the dust started going up into the air, man, I saw the rays of light going through the canopy like magic. And that's when I said to the couple to go ahead and start walking the way I told them to walk. And then they did everything perfectly. The flash fired, the, the, the car picked up the dust. I went behind the trees in order to frame them with two trees. So I didn't stand in front of the road. I went, I stood on the side of the road so I could use the trees as, as a framing device. And the photo is was just magical, man. Just completely well, and and magical. I want to. I, I was going to bring up the video that you gave me, but first of all, because you just said where you're standing between the two trees, the composition of this picture is really. This is why I try and tell people: yes, you can break composition rules. The standard rules of composition are more guidelines than rules, but you got to know the rules because strong composition is everything. And here. You've got a frame within a frame. So you've got the picture frame. You've got a picture. There's multiple photos in here, actually. You've got a picture of a dirt road that happens to have a couple on it. You've got a picture of a bride and groom between two trees, the canopy of the trees, the darkness on the ground, and the two trees on the side form a frame around them. It has leading lines of the angle of the trees going down. The bride and groom are on a rule of thirds, which it just so happens another tree is on a rule of thirds. There's so much going on here this probably actually is a good place to show that video right yeah i think that would be fun for people and i get and what you're saying about the composition uh i gotta tell you that composition element is 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 incredibly important for you to stop take a second and say in any location that you are not only question the the different compositions that are available to you but ask yourself what lenses would 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 best bring up the composition for example if you have like a Canon 11 to 24 millimeter lens, that changes the composition of things because the, the geometry changes, it gets exaggerated. So if you have these l super wide lenses or whatever, what can you do with these lenses to, to, uh, to let the composition sing, right? So it's not just coming up with a, with a composition that's in that area or the different variations of the composition that are present to you in that area. I'm talking about how would your, some of your lenses behave in that location. How would a two, if you have like a place with a lot of trees, how would a 200 millimeter lens com compress the tree lines and, and what would that do to the final photograph? So let's play that video. But I think, I think you, you got to ask yourself those two questions about composition, the location and what the lenses would do in that location. Okay. So I'm going to roll the video and then uh, it's got its own audio. Roberto and I'll be back right after this. Can you tell us when to go, you tell us when to go in there? You can take them off. Okay. Now you just tell me. Tell them to go fast. Tell me when you're ready for them. Okay, go tell them. Go ahead. Ready? Come on. <laughs> Walk around. Right into the dirt. Okay, good. Okay, so the video is, first of all, I love the way that you said, tell him to go fast. And she yells out, okay, come on. Um, <laughs> she saw that. There's a lot going on there. First of all, the shot of the video looking down the road lets you really realize how bright it was outside, by the way. I did not realize that from looking at the, this particular shot. You'd think it's almost dusk. It's really bright back where the car was originally at. Um, not to mention when they walked out, there actually was 
a, a rather shocking amount of dust that they were walking out into. I love that you did that. So let me ask you this. <laughs> you get this, you know, the, the, the video ended with putting it all together and it went from driving down the road, bright day, you've suddenly got a ton of dust, you make a bride and groom walk out into a cloud of dust, <laughs> and uh, this comes out of it. Well, there's obviously some other stuff in there. What is the post that you might have done to a shot like this? We sharpened the trees quite a bit all over the frame. We flattened the curve, and then we brought the contrast up only on the rays. So you flatten the curve. So whatever the curve that Photoshop tries to automatically add to the photograph, I, I killed that because I didn't want it to be contrasty everywhere. I only wanted it to be contrasty in the rays. Um, this is, I don't, I don't do compositions, composites, I'm sorry. I don't do composites. This is the actual picture. Uh, as, but things where uh, the, the rays of light had to, had to be accentuated by, by changing the curve of the photograph and adding contrast to just that. The rest of the photograph, we lowered the contrast on the rest, except for the rays and the couple. Um, I brought up the shadow details just a little bit. And uh, you can see I, I might have pushed it a little bit too much on the trees in the back. So you, you could actually see the tree. Oh, detail. no, I don't think so. I love it. Oh, it looks good. Okay. And uh, and then no, I, I lowered the I shadow detail it. on the on the groom's uh, clothing so it would contrast from the tree trunks. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. If you saw too much detail in his tuxedo, right. he'd almost get lost. It would not work. So we had to grab yeah. him, lower the contrast on him. I mean increase the contrast on him and decrease the contrast on the tree trunks behind him and everywhere else. You know what I mean? Let me ask you this, because in, in looking at this photo close up, there is some grain in it. Yeah. Do you add grain to your pictures? There was, okay, so I went through a phase back in my career where I was adding uh, monochrome grain to the photo and I would add a little bit of noise to that. And it looks, it has a fun effect. I, I, I kind of like it. I still like it. I probably wouldn't do that today, Steve. But back in the day, I did have, I did go through that phase where it made it look more like film or whatever the intention was. Um, That's what it but, looks like. It looks like a color film emulation almost. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And like I said, I looking back, I probably wouldn't do that today. But I did do that before and, I, and, you know, it was successful and I kept going. Whenever I would do, whenever the photos had a lot of that depth, like this one, I would add grain. If the photos did not have depth, like if, if, if the couple was in front of a wall or something like that, I would not do that. Uh, if the photo was black and white, I would add that, I would add noise. You know, it's interesting here because here's what I think it does to this image and why it's a critical part of it actually in this image. And that is, there is a an almost surreal painting effect, partially because of the way you did the light rays, partially because of the mood that it's clear that the viewer is standing in a dark shadow under the trees voyeuristically, almost looking out into this lit fairy tale land, which we now know had a car, <laughs> you know, but... There's this, what what that adds to it, that textury feel adds to it is almost a painting effect that I I like. I, I want to get, yeah, just, wow. This shot that, is just really well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, that this, this is the beginning, Steve, of my reward or the reward for spending so much time practicing speed and efficiency and creating different scenarios at home using vegetables. Because when I get to when, when when it's when it's go time, when it's performance time, I think one of the reasons why my career has been successful is because instead of choking and defaulting to to, to whatever the three or four things I always do in every wedding, I was able to bring something very exciting to, to the table. And couples loved that. Like the photo of the Rolls Royce uh, at night, which is the cover of my other wedding storyteller book. That's another example. Which where was one of the ones that and you know what I, I I've got a number of your shots here and I uh, that I was going to load as we were talking and mm -hmm. I'll do that in a minute just as we're talking <laughs> about other stuff I'll pull up other images and just show them to you that was mm -hmm. one of the ones I wanted to discuss too and it's interesting <laughs> you, what you say about all that repetition what it taught you because really 
it's what we tell people in concert photography. You can't be in a photo pit at a major concert and not know your gear. You better be able to change your exposure <laughs> without thinking about what you're doing. You know, whether it be a reciprocal that you're going to modify two items to end up with the exact same exposure, but with a different shutter or one or the other, you've practicing this stuff so that you can do it mindlessly lets you also have time to experiment. So for example, you could have gone on this shot and done those three shots that every other photographer does and been safe. That's right. But because you're fast, you then would have had time still to play. Speed gives you options, right? Like if you are fast, you have options. And one thing that I want to tell the photographers listening is options is why I love photography. You could have a subject in front of you and photograph that person in so many ways you could, you could end up in a place like this warm, slow Savannah, Georgia. And if you don't have options, then you're going to go to the middle and photograph the couple kissing in the middle. And that's the end of it. But because I, I love photography, I love what it does to, to, to your, to your brain and, and, and to the visuals and, and to people when they see the photo, there is always magic in the air, Steve. There's always magic in every location. It takes a skilled photographer to find that magic and pull it out. You have to be able to harness these magical things that are in every location. And whether that's the posing, the lighting, or the composition, and in this case, all three, then that's what it takes. But what a shame to go to a place like that and not not see it. Does that make sense? Like, not see the potential. Oh, yeah. You know? Or if you're a photographer that shoots in the same locations over and over, I got to tell you, stop, take a breather, and find the magic in those places. Because I'm telling you, there is... The magic is there. You you have to be able... In this case, it took a car driving across the dirt road as fast as possible to bring the magic out. Well, bring that. Maybe that's what it takes. Whatever it takes, find it. Because one thing I love about photography, which is why you'll never be bored as a photographer, is that every location is a puzzle waiting to be discovered. You know? And... And it takes the skill of a photographer who's not afraid to experiment, who's not afraid to do something other than the norm to bring those magical magical pieces out of every single location that you're in. You know, you just actually answered what my next question was going to be, which was what can a regular working photographer do to get more artistic? And it's to stop and slow down and find that chili sauce that's in the location that you're shooting each and every weekend because you tend to shoot the same place or because they refer you. I do have one question before we close mm -hmm. out and give people uh, uh, ways to reach you. Uh, for example, I want people to definitely go to your Instagram account because you've got amazing stuff on Instagram. Uh, so we'll give out the Instagram uh, shortly. It's been popping up under you as a lower third. It's, it's Roberto underscore photo on Instagram, at Roberto right. underscore photo. But there's one question I wanted to ask first. And... If you could tell somebody in one sentence the answer to this question, I'm curious what it would be. What makes a great wedding photo? I would say emotional impact. And I don't mean just to the family or to the or to the or to the family or to the couple. I'm talking about to every person that sees that photograph, whether they are involved with that family or not. It's emotional impact. Uh, a, a, a skilled wedding photographer brings can photograph things in a way, photographs in a way at a wedding that brings emotion to his captures or her captures. A skilled fashion photographer finds a way to showcase the clothing and makes the photo awkward enough to make it exciting so people look at it. But a wedding photographer that's really skilled has choices they can make to increase the level of emotional impact a photo can have. There is a special, there's certain type of lightings that will help bring emotion out. There is certain type of apertures that can be used to create emotions out. There is Composition is one of the strongest things a wedding photographer has to be a master of um, because composition is what creates a multi-layer story being told in a single photograph, you know? So to me, oh, yeah. when, 
You see what I'm saying? So to me, when people say what what makes a good wedding photographer or a good wedding photograph, I'm like, holy smokes, man! It's it's a whole skill set to bring emotion to a photograph that you take. So you take these photos and they bring so, emotion. Okay, so if people were to go look up one photographer other than Roberto Valenzuela, uh, if they were to look up one pho- photographer that they don't know, who should they look up? One of the, my favorite wedding photographers in the world that just blows my mind. Can I say two? Sure. Two people? The first guy would be Marcus Bell. Marcus Bell, B-E-L-L. He's out of Australia. That guy is a genius wedding photographer. World's top wedding photographer. World, one of the world's best in my eyes. Okay. And the second one that's just a killer, this guy is a ninja of composition, is Jeff Asco. Jeff Asco. That's the, I can't spell the last name. I think it's A S C O U G H T or something. Jeff Asco. He's out of London or he's out of the UK. I've never met the guy. I would love to meet him. I've never met him, but I have admired him my entire career as, as much as I have admired Marcus Bell for his ability to make me cry every time I see a photo that he took. I'm like, I'm not even involved with that family. And I, I, my heart is just like, my, my heart is just like breaking apart, you know? I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do that every time? You know, and that and, guy, and Jeff Asco. there's something? You no, know, go ahead. That guy, Jeff Asco. I mean, as people look at his photos, I mean, it's just like, what is happening? Like, how could you be so skilled, you know? I mean, man, that, that guy puts it in okay. perspective. So, people, you've got two to go look up. Marcus Bell, Jeff Esco, and real quick, uh, photo creators, conference, and experience. Obviously, there's because of what's happening in the world, there's been a slight delay, but it's still going to happen. The website is there. You can get all the information there. Where can people go? I encourage people to at least look at the information on the website called thephotocreators.com. And if you go to the homepage, there is a new section on the homepage that says sign up for the mailing list or for the email list. So you you can actually be aware of what the new dates will be, which will probably be October or November, probably more October or early November. The conference is going to have, it's going to take you through a, a journey of lighting skills from natural light to LED lights, which is going to be taught by Jen Rosenbaum, to my section, which will be, which will be everything that has to do with flashes and speed lights, to uh, Joel Grimes. He's going to be there to teach everything that has to do with big strobes and strobe modifiers, like, like bigger studio strobes kind of thing, outdoors and indoors, to create those magical portraits that he does. And then Rocco from Australia will be teaching you how to edit your photos, how to do retouching on those photos, and how to print them in a, in a real masterful way with your inkjet printer, like a Canon Pro 1000 or whatever printer you may have. But whether you go to the Canon class Pro or not- Pro 1000 behind me. Yeah, you have a Pro 1000 behind you, which is an amazing printer. And it has made me a lot of money because I, I a lot of my income comes from selling prints to clients. But that, that machine is a, like a workhorse for me. But um, the conference is going to be happening. I am very excited. It is, it is very dedicated to helping the, the photographer get better. And I really mean that. I mean, get better, not in a loose or general way. I want people to really have a, a, an expanded skill set once you leave, that you have options from that conference on, you have options to create something magical because you have the tools and the skill set to do it. And that's my goal. I hope people take advantage. It's a very rare to have Joe Grimes, Jen, Rocco, and me all in one ranch all together all hanging out, drinking wine at night, and learning as much as we can to expand our creativity and separate ourselves from the rest. While you have wine, I'll have wine with you, or I'll have a whiskey, one of the two. Probably whiskey. Um, And speaking of which, while I'm thinking about it, that's actually a good thing to do while you people are stuck at home, is these (laughs) conferences are coming back. All of this will settle down. Now's the time to actually make notes of what you want to do. Make a bucket list of what you want to do when things get back to normal, which they will. They always do. And, the, you know, this conference should should definitely be on there. The Photo Creators Conference and Experience, thephotocreators.com. Roberto, where can people find you? What Your website? 
Uh, yeah, robertovalenzuela.com and my Instagram, roberto underscore photos. And I just want to say, if you're going to follow the Instagram, I do try to put a, a portrait and then a BTS photo on the next picture on my Instagram account. A lot of my photos have that. So if you want to see how a photo that I posted was done, my Instagram account will, will do that many times. Not always, but many times. Okay. And I actually had it. And I think the lower third say Roberto underscore photo. Right. There's no S, right? No, it's, it's not Roberto photos. underscore photo. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And uh, to everybody, first of all, Roberto, thank you so much for joining me, man. I, I can't say thanks enough because I'm dead serious. I've walked by and went, I want to stand and listen to this, but I'm 400 feet away <laughs> because there are so many people standing and watching you. So I appreciate you're doing this, man, very, very much. I appreciate all your time and all the effort and research you did on every show you do, including this one. It's super nice to have someone like you doing uh, hosting these things and taking it as serious as you do and bringing these amazing little moments of joy in such a difficult time for people, for people's lives. And I think we all thank you for that because we all want to just escape reality, like you said, for just a little bit. And this is a nice little cookie that we can all just have and enjoy for 15 minutes. Well, again, thank you very much. You can check him out at robertovalenzuela.com, Roberto underscore photo on Instagram, Roberto Valenzuela Weddings on Facebook. Put it this way, if you Google him, he's going to end up showing up somewhere in the Google search results. A couple things to let you know about before I close. First of all, Don Komarechka, I mentioned this at the beginning, Don Komarechka does the podcast Photo Geek Weekly. By the way, uh, congratulations to him because he just released the week that we're recording this probably a week before this one goes live, his 100th Photo Geek Weekly episode. So Don, congratulations. I was the guest on it and it was an absolute joy as always. But Don and I are doing something actually that Roberto's familiar with because he does judging at a lot of image competitions. We're doing photo critiques. And if you want to get in on it, all you have to do is go over to Flickr and sign up for an account. It can be the free account. Once you are signed up, join or subscribe to the Behind the Shot group on Flickr and then submit your images. Now you can submit your images just to participate in the group. But if you also tag them with a Flickr tag of BTS critique, all one word, that also enters them into the pool that we choose from for these photo critique shows that we're doing at the beginning of each and every month. We're usually doing about 10 images at the beginning of each month, and we're having an absolute blast with it. So join in, participate, have some fun. Other than that, as I said, I'm Steve Brazel. This is Behind the Shot. I want to thank my guest once again, Roberto Valenzuela. If you need to reach out to me, all of my lower thirds are coming up as well, but it's at Steve Brazel, like the country Brazil, but two L's on either Twitter or Instagram, and it's Behind the Shot TV on either Twitter or on Instagram. I'm on Facebook too, but to be honest, I don't really use Facebook a lot. I'm not a huge fan. So with that in mind to everybody, thanks for watching. Check out the blog post. It's at BehindTheShot.tv. Stay safe out there. This is Behind the Shot. 